Guys, I want to just share with you how Jesus saved my life. And um, before that, I just want to read a verse of Scripture to, the, to you that was running through my spirit this morning. If you'd open your Bible or your iPhone, or if you're in sin and you have a Samsung, uh, open to uh, the book of Ephesians. <laughs> the book of Ephesians. I like that. He did a little piano bit part on there when I said that. That's good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead, dead, not alive, completely dead. He made alive in once, which you once walked, verse two, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom you also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That's who I was that's who you were. And I'm going to share with you how much of a wrathful child I was. But um, the beauty of this scripture is found in the next verse. It says, just as the others, but verse four, but God. How many of you understand everything is dark, but God? You know, what good is the moon unless the sun shines on it? Everything is dark. The moon's a reflection. As soon as God comes in though, but God, He changes everything. But God who is rich in mercy, not poor, His bank vault is full of mercy. doesn't matter where you came from. Like our precious sister who shared her testimony, there is no condemnation. One of the worst things I see in the whole world is inside the Christian world. It's the judgment of where I'm at and where others aren't. God, anyone can, God can draw anyone to the mercy feet of Jesus, to those holes that are burning brass in His feet that bled for all of us. Even if you grew up in the church and prayed 15 hours a day, that same hole was for you. But God who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us. (laughs) Isn't it amazing that God actually loves you? You know, one of the biggest struggles I ever had as a believer was to believe God loved me. I didn't struggle to pray. I didn't struggle to fast. I didn't struggle to preach the gospel. I struggled more to believe God actually likes me. He actually loves you. Listen, you don't have to be like everybody else. If two of you become identical, one of you is unnecessary here. You may as well go home. God made you fashioned in His image. We spoke about it in the car. Pastor Vlad and I need the help of women to fashion us. But we are fashioned by the Lord, marked out in His image, breathed on face to face. The very first thing that God ever saw and that man ever saw through the eyes of God, when God looked down at man, the very first thing He saw of man was the eyes of man opening and looking him in the eyes. God was always about intimacy. He was always about his image. You're the image of God. He's rich in mercy. He really does love you. He won't love you more when you finish that fast. He adores you. That's why you can worship in spirit and truth and worship with true adoration. Sometimes people are like Christian penguins. They're so stiff and I'm no longer a slave to fear, but they're fearful of everyone's thoughts. They're full of fear. That's why I love new Christians when they first get saved because they have no idea how they're supposed to be. They just are. When I meet little kids, one time I was preaching the gospel in this church and and this little kid, the pastor took an offering for me and they put it in a basket right here. It was kind of quite awkward to be quite honest with you. I'm behind the pulpit and people are walking up putting money in so I kind of turned my back. I didn't want to see what they were giving me. It was very awkward. He put it right there. But a little girl, she was about four or five. She saw this basket full of money. And as I was preaching, not in the offering time, later, 10, 15 minutes later, as I was preaching, she walked up on stage. I said, hello, sweetheart. She came up on stage and she looked at the money and she jumped into that basket. And then she began to distribute it all and throw it out back to the crowd. You know why? Because no one told her how to behave. She is. Do you understand what I'm saying? She just is. She's a child of joy, of fun. And you're a child of God. God is rich in mercy over you because of His great love with which He loved you. For even while we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Amen. And I'm about to tell you how I was saved. But I wanted to read this because there's no one here. There is nobody. When you hear my testimony, you'll be like, wow, God really can save. There's nobody in this room or watching on that live stream that God cannot completely deliver and transform. I was raised in a Christian home. My father was a golf professional by, that's what he did for a living. He played golf. 
um, he, he heard about this man, an African named Reinhard Bonnke. And Reinhard Bonnke had a ministry at the time where they had around, you know, maybe 30,000 people meeting in this tent that they had, this big yellow tent. And my father in Australia, where I grew up, my father, there was no internet then, you know, it was in the 80s. My father, he had this just strong conviction from God that we must move to Africa as a family. We have to go there. And, and I'm a little kid and my dad was my hero. You know, people have like Superman and all these things. My father was it to me. Everything was about my dad. You know, and I'd go to school as a kid and people would say, you know, they're going to bring their favorite toy. And, and I would actually literally bring my dad. I would say, Dad, can you come for the show and tell? Because you're supposed to show a part of your life that you love. And I would have my dad come. And I loved him, man. I was obsessed with my father. And, uh, and he was my, like, um, you know, you, you couldn't have a son that was more infatuated with a father. And he looked a bit similar to me, full beard and everything. And, and he was a golfer. And, but he was a very sweet man, very, very loving man. And he used to give everything away. And, uh, and I remember that as a kid because, you know, he would just always, people would always be coming to our house who were like golfers and, and some of them were young kids and 17, 18, he would train them up and, and then he'd preach to them, tell them about Jesus. And still I have contact today with some of these people who are professionals who, who got saved through him. And, uh, and he would give all these clubs to them for free and he'd pray for them and just always full of life and, and very loving. And he felt from God. He said to my mother, Jenny, he said, we need to move to Africa. He goes, what God is doing in these, in these uh, tents and saving people. He goes, I'm feeling the Lord telling us, move to Africa. We need to go there and serve Reinhard Bonnke, who at the time was um, not as known as he is now. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, you can look him up online. The, their ministry has seen around 79, 80 million people led to the Lord Jesus, 80 million. But at the time, it was 30,000. You know, it wasn't so big. And so as a little kid, I was just like, awesome, we're going to go to Africa. And my dad went first kind of to spy out the land. And he had sent one year worth of letters, one year in the mail, letters every week or every second week, like 30 to 40 letters. And he sent them to Africa until he finally got a reply from a man named Peter Vandenberg. And he said, come. He obviously could tell my dad's dedication was very real. He was going to give up the, the golf profession, which paid well. Um, our young, you know, me, five, six years old with my brother and sister, young kids, the, the living for the gospel's sake. And he, um, he basically went by himself to interview there in Africa. But he called my mom a little bit into the trip. And he said, Jenny, I need you to pray for me. He said, in, in my hotel room, the walls are moving. And uh, she said, what do, you, what do you mean the walls are moving? He's, he said, the walls, I, I, I can see them moving. And he was really freaking out. And she said, my mom said, she goes, you need to go to the pastors and the leaders there in, in, in CFAN and get them to pray for you. And so he did. They laid hands on him. But it got worse. And right before he was supposed to have his interview, a few weeks, he'd been there already three weeks or so, right before he was supposed to have this interview. Uh, my mom made the decision. She said, it's not going well. She, he's not sleeping. She said, you need to come home. So he flew back to Australia. When he came back in the presence of my mother, they're both praying people. He, he was better a little bit. He calmed down a little bit, but he was still having these things where he'd get anxious all the time. And he didn't know why. And then on my brother's first birthday, when I was six years of age, we were about to cut the cake and everything. And, and all of a sudden I hear for the first time, really, my father um, yelling and like crazy. And then back then we had these old telephones that you put down on a thing and you ring with your finger. And, uh, and my, all of a sudden, I, I see my dad run and he's screaming at my mother and, and he throws the telephone through the front window, big window of the house. And this is completely the opposite nature of, um, of him. And so I grabbed my one-year-old brother out of instinct and my mom said, take him across the road because they were friends with our family. And I took him and, and I said, something's wrong with my dad. And she rang the, the ambulance, the police, you know, the, and, and they came. And, and to cut a long story short, my father ended up, they put him in, you know, in a suit type thing and, and they, they put him in a mental hospital and, and they diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, something he never had before. And uh, he came back from Africa, a different man to who he was when he left. And so um, we continued to, to, at that point, to just pray, I guess. And every day, my dad was in there sometimes for two months, really bad, really serious. They put him on lith lithium, which means you're like basically you can't function. You know, he'd sit at the kitchen table and he'd still read his Bible. He loved the Lord so much, but he couldn't function correctly. 
and so lazy and it's not his fault because of the medication, you know. And so for me, that was my hero, my dad. And so we would pray in the evenings. My mom would pray and he would sometimes come in and pray as well. And she'd say, one day when your dad's delivered, we're going to have ice cream cake and we're going to give praise to God. And I, I just remembered that as a kid because we prayed so many times about this day of deliverance. But sadly, where I went to school, the people in my school didn't understand any of that. They weren't Christians like we were. And my last name is Fitzgerald and he had schizophrenia. So some of the kids got the two words, Fitz the Skits, and they teased me my whole upbringing and beat me up. And, and I was a little kid. I was not tall, a skinny kid, you know, believe it or not. But um, I, I was not tall and, and, and they would tease me, Fitz the Skits, and I'd come home crying every day and, and I had no friends. And, and so uh, at that point, at eight years of age, I began to be addicted to pornography and I would walk out the back of our house and hide this stuff in the ground, in the dirt, literally bury it in the dirt. And I would look at pornography with no sex drive. I didn't have a, a drive for sexual things. I would just look at these women on a page because it would make me feel like someone loves me. And my dad was, at that point, he was a bit incoherent. He, he couldn't do what he used to do. He used to hug me and kiss me all the time. And he just wasn't like that anymore. I'd sometimes say, Dad, and he'd just look over. I couldn't get his attention the same way. And so I began to be addicted to pornography at the age of eight, fully addicted. And, uh, and then by the age of like nine, I was actually selling the pornography, it was very weird how, what I started to do, and, but still not looking at it with lustful capacities. It was very strange because you're a little kid. And then uh, still though, every night, you know, or every two nights, my mom, she'd come into my bed and she said, let's pray for dad. And, and I just pray for dad. And, and so then we couldn't leave the house because in that four year period between like six and when I was 10 years old, my father was so volatile, we couldn't leave because if we left the house, he may smash, you know, my mum was his full-time carer. He couldn't work as a golf professional anymore. Everything was, and, and still we're believing when he gets delivered, we're all going to go back to Africa because we're supposed to work for Bonky. That's God's will. And uh, we had one day, the first day where they said my mum and my dad had talked and my dad was a bit concerned that we never got away out of the house ever. We never went anywhere in four and a half years. And so um, my mom and dad agreed that, that she would take me, my sister and brother away for one night. And my dad gave me this little handheld fishing reel. My mom took us near a beach around about an hour's drive from our house. And we stayed in a tent one night and my dad gave me a little fishing reel, you know, the ones you put with your hand as a little kid. And, um, and he sat me down, it was interesting. He sat me down and he gave me this fishing reel. He started crying. He said, he said, Ben, I love you. And I was like, I love you too, dad. I love you, Dad, you know, so I loved him. And he, when he said that, it was real special because he didn't say that quite as much those days, you know. And he gave me this hand fishing reel and he just looked at me and just, he just had tears in his eyes. It was a very, very deep moment. I was like, I love you, Dad. And he, he gave me that fishing reel. And I went away that night with my mom and with my brother and sister. And I put the fishing reel in. And I, I honestly believe to this day that was the Lord because I had no idea what I was doing, you know. And I put it over the side of a pier and I caught a fish. And, uh, and that's what the last thing my dad said to me before we left that night was, catch me a fish. So I did. And I slept with that thing. My mom was so angry. She wrapped in newspaper, you know, and I slept with the fish. Like I put it, she's like, get that thing out of the tent. You know, I love that fish. And I was so excited the next day. So we're driving back to, to see dad and I just couldn't wait to show him the fish. So I was the first one to run inside. And I said, dad, you know, dad. It's like, I caught you a fish, dad. And, and he wasn't responding. He was, I, I thought, well, maybe he's asleep. And I, I ran around the house and I got into his bedroom and he, there he was in bed. And I said, Dad, Dad, I caught you a fish. Dad, and I'm looking at him and I go, Dad, 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 nothing. So I dropped the fish and I walked over to him and I, and I touched him and his head was ice cold. And I jumped back and I actually felt something dark on me, a 10. And he was dead and I knew instantly, he's dead. I said, mom, I said, I said, mom. I started screaming and she's like, what? And I ran outside where she was unloading the car. I said, dad's dead. I said, he's dead. And she goes, don't, she goes, don't you dare say that. I said, mommy, he is dead. I said, help mom, help. And she freaked out, she went inside and then I ran. I ran from the house. I didn't run inside, I ran. I took off. The police found me several hours later by myself. My father that night, he'd taken 70 sleeping tablets, seven zero. He committed suicide. He took his life, it was too much. He felt like what he was doing to our family and he'd have these violent outbursts and he just couldn't do it anymore. 
and he, he felt like he'd put us through such suffering and he took his own life. But at that point, I began to run. I mean, I really ran. The two hour of me going alone was an indication of what was happening in here. See, my hero and everything I live for, the love that I received from him, it was dying, but it really died in that moment, you know. I really took on this deep, deep wound of grief and rejection. And when you mix rejection with an already strong porn addiction, you mix the two together, what's going to happen? You're just going to get pretty dark, you know. And so I ran and I ran. I cut my mother off. I cut my sister and brother off. I mean, I still spoke to my mother, but I, I, was diff- I was just a completely different boy. As soon as I could, I did everything I could do to rebel. I went to school. My mom tried to get me into school. I was a smart kid, but I just started to rebel like crazy. Different boy. I was gentle, sweet like my dad, funny and everything. And then before that I, and after that, a different person. And then I was in school. And so every time I could do, I'd gr- grab an apple and just throw it at the, the leader of the school, hit the leader in the head, I'm kicked out of school. You know, and then next minute I'm out of school, something like that would happen, you know. Next minute at 14 years of age, I'm leaving school completely. I started working as an apprentice. Now the porn addiction has become sexual. Now it's become an addiction to women, not pornography. 14 years of age, I'm living by myself. I I move into this house with an older man to do an apprenticeship. And I just start running down this road. And I was doing exactly what I did after I touched my dad's dead head. When I touched him, I, I just ran inside. So sin and grief, this terrible concoction, you know. The Bible says clearly though, like I just read in Ephesians 2.1, we've all sinned. Every trespass is the same. Even if I didn't have the grief, the sin would still be causing me to run. Because you're running from the truth of what can really redeem you. And my dad, he was my world. So everything about my life was, I want him to be healed. I was exceptionally disappointed. You know, and angry inside. Why didn't this happen? And why didn't, why wasn't he delivered? And I was so sure. And and so I was just running and and. Next minute, I find myself in very bad scenarios. I find myself at, you know, 17, 18 years of age, starting to deal the drug ecstasy and, uh, and playing pool, you know, pool like eight ball, nine ball. I used to play four to six hours a day. In fact, I could have been, if I continued in the road I was in, I could have been a professional. Uh, I was very, very good and, um, and trying to become a professional pool player, but I was dealing ecstasy and using women. A woman would come into my life. She'd be in my world for a month. Her world would be destroyed all the manipulation in me, all the the using of people, all the toughness. I put on this tough face. I wasn't tough at all. On the inside, I was terrified. But I was hardened on the outside because of this grief and sin and, and all of the things that sin produces. It slowly just inches you further toward the death of conscience and then the death of the flesh and then the eternal death, which is not a real death. It's where you're in hell. And it's where you're faced with everything that you ever did and demons are your masters. It's terrible. That place is not for any human being. That's why God came in the flesh of His own Son. God in the likeness of man, uh, sorry, God in, in the image of God came down in the likeness of man, that man in this fallen image of man may come back to the likeness of God. And, and this is Jesus, you know. And I didn't know that Jesus. I just knew grief and sin. I used to do terrible things, but I, I don't want to really boast about them because they're stupid. They're just, they're honestly just the, the outcome of sin and grief. But I would do weird things. Like I would, I would turn off all the lights in my house. I hated natural light. I'd go to bed at four in the morning. I'd put the shower on cold and sit there in the freezing shower because I thought that I deserved to not have a good shower, even though I was in sin. I had all these strange things that I would do. I, I, I wouldn't want natural light on. People would turn the light on in the lounge room. I'd say, turn it off, turn the light off. I was afraid of light. I was, I was beating myself. I, maybe I blame myself for my father's suicide because I went away the night that he committed suicide. But the last thing he said to me was catch me a fish. And I did. But by this point now, I'm destroying everyone who's in my world. I'm fake. I'm wearing so many masks you wouldn't believe. Like I was manipulative. I could do anything. I could take a sales job and just turn it into, I'd be a great salesman. And then within a few weeks, I'd steal from them, majorly steal from them. I would collect money for a disabled foundation. I'm not disabled. I lied. I began to collect false government checks. I knew what to do. I was a bad kid. I lived out of home since 14. My mother was heartbroken though. And my mother was like many of you in this crowd or many of you watching at home. My mother was a praying mother. And my mother never let go of Jesus. And she never let go of me. And I tell you what, I'd rather have the mafia against me than a praying mother any day. If you're in this crowd or you're at home watching and you're like, I'm, I'm kind of backslidden, I'm not fully with Jesus and you have a praying mum, you may as well just get down here and repent because you are doomed. You are doomed. She's going to get you. God will get you because of that woman. So the Holy Spirit 
begin to speak to me in nightclubs. God was haunting me. I had all these beautiful women. I had all this stuff that you'd think you'd want. I could put cocaine up my nose, but inside I was dying. The sin, the, 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 I'll be my man. I'll, be, I'll do my thing. I'll, be, I'll shut down my heart. I'll, all these things that I did, all they led to was just further and further inward darkness and shame. It just was nothing. It felt like nothing, but it was all fake. And then I had a profound experience. My girlfriend at the time like looked like a supermodel, worked at the nightclub that I was in and I used to go to that nightclub all the time and sell drugs and stuff and just try and act like a tough guy. And, and this thing was starting to wear off on me. And one night it was like God opened the veil on me and I felt so depressed but it was like I could see all these people in a dark club rubbing up against each other, trying to drink, and they just talk such a big game. They talk such a big life. And, and, I, was, and I knew a lot of these people and I just, just could see them. And I'm like, I'm like, what's happening here? And it's like God lifted the veil on me. And I could see this human search for significance. Like the preacher says of Ecclesiastes, by the way, the wealthiest man who ever lived at the sum total of his life at the very end says, all is vanity. All is grasping for the wind. He could look over his palisades, massive mansions. He had 12 bronze lions around the largest swimming pool you've ever seen. And he looked out there and all these women he had. And he said, all is vanity. It's grasping for the wind. To know God is life. He had everything, but didn't have this. And, and he understood. And I begin to understand for some reason, I didn't think of God, but I thought of the people. I'm like, what are we doing? Why, we, why is everyone trying to be, have a six pack? Why does everybody have to look better than the next guy? Why is that girl going home with a guy she just met? He could be a rapist. Why? And I, I started to think about this. And I said to my girlfriend working in the club, I said, Alina, her name was Alina, which actually is almost like a bit of a Ukrainian sort of Russian name. Alina, I said, Alina, I'm going home. She goes, are you okay? I said, no. I said, this is all fake. I threw the drugs out in the crowd. And I said, this is all fake. I went to my house. I did exactly what I did every night in my house. I turned the lights off when I got in. I sat there and I lit up a cigarette. All that was in my, the, the lounge room of my house was the light of a cigarette. Smelt like terrible. I lived with other people who dealt drugs. It was a terrible place to be. Terrible place to live. I lit up a cigarette and I turned on the TV for a minute and there was a man preaching on the TV. And it was offensive at first to me. And I would have usually shut it down. People used to come to me and say, my mum, for example, I'd go to her house and hide drugs sometimes. And she'd stop me in the hallway. And she'd say, I'm praying for you. I'd say, get out of my way. And the demons in me would tell me, like, run out the back. There's something in me would be like, get away from your mother. Because she had power. She had God in her. And I'd say, don't you ever pray for me. I'd threaten her and stuff. And, and, and she wouldn't care. She'd go, God's told me you are going to preach the gospel all around the earth. She goes, God has promised me. And, and I, wouldn't, I didn't believe her. But with the light of only a cigarette. See, I had all this other stuff, you know. I had cash in my pocket. All this thing, these things you think would build your security. Beautiful women. Oh, you can have all that. Everybody gets old, but... You can have beauty, it's not bad, it's good, but it doesn't last forever. You can have money in your pocket, that comes, that goes. You can burn that thing up in a second. Someone can drop you like that. You can be fired from the biggest company, can turn bankrupt. How many stories have we heard about people who all of a sudden, at the very top of the echelon of the corporate chain, are jumping off a bridge committing suicide because everything they put themselves into is a paper note. They fractionalize their identity. People do it now with Instagram. You can do it with your Instagram. I'm going to become popular. You know what you're telling God? I'm worth someone double tapping on a screen. What a joke. What, a, what an absolute, I mean, if you could subtract humanity down to its lowest level and show what sin really is, there it is. Like my value comes from a comment on a Facebook. That's how I was, but I didn't realize that's how I was. So I turned the TV off after a few minutes of listening to that preacher. But God was not done with that sermon. And I didn't know that. Just the light of the cigarette and then the left side of the room. The Lord Jesus entered the left side of my lounge room at 4.15 in the morning. And as Jesus came into the left side of that lounge room, I mean, I'm sitting there with a cigarette in my hand, filthy, full of sin. You have no idea. Like I had the girlfriend. You might, might think, oh, he just had a girlfriend. No, -uh. I was addicted to prostitutes too. I cheated on her every week. I was a manipulator. I did not know who I was. I was fake. I didn't know my value. I was longing for someone to show it to me, but I didn't know it. It was a mask. And 
Jesus came and I knew, I knew somehow it's God because when he came through, it came through the left side of the lounge room and I have a cigarette there. And all of a sudden in my heart, I can feel, and it was like, like kind of like loud through me. I can feel this presence and then the voice of God thundering on the inside of me. And the first thought I had, I remember the very first thought was like, how can God be talking in me? I'm not a Christian. How can his voice, I was really confused by it. I was like, I know how I live, and, but I can f- hear this voice inside me that was not my conscience. You might say, oh, Ben, that was your voice. You imagine it. You did drugs. No. You can't imagine yourself to forgive everybody that's ever hurt you. You can't imagine yourself to stop trying to beat people in the face. You can't imagine yourself to stop trying to, to make money as your God. And you can't imagine to just be on your face days later begging your mom to forgive you, telling her, I love you. Please forgive me for all the pain I caused you. A little voice in your head cannot make that kind of a transformation. But with this cigarette in my hand, Jesus spoke to me. You know what he said? He said, son. Jesus called me his son before I'd even said the sinner's prayer. He said, son, I love you. And he said, I want you to give your life to me. And then for one hour, he began to tell me about my life, about who he is, about the gospel and about my future. And I just lost it. I mean, I, for the first time in, in years, I was crying. I was, I was an absolute mess. And, and I could feel like this waves of peace. And even though with the cigarette, he never told me, put down the cigarette. He never told me, I'll talk to you once you finish your cigarette. Jesus is not religion. Jesus is God. Jesus knows the state of man. He's not a God who comes to put another heavy burden on you. He's a God who comes to lift them, to lift the thousand pounds of falsehood and sin and weight that's on your soul. And and so as Jesus began to speak to me, I just lost it. And the Lord began to tell me He loved me and it was inside me, the voice on the inside. How can Jesus speak to a prostitute addict like that? How can Jesus speak to a fake man that I was, like the the liar I was? It's because He made you. And it's because he bled and already took that liar on the cross. He took that man. He took that fake stuff. He took all that falsehood. He took that addiction to sex that I had since eight. He took it all there on that cross. He died as me. He was in all things poor that I might in him become rich in him. He became the poorest of poor. We don't understand his suffering. How can you go from the most glorious place to the lowest place? and be happy and joyful to do it for the joy set before Him. How can you do that? Someone loses their car or their job and they're depressed. He bankrupted Himself out of heaven and even had the greatest things. See, to me, my Father was everything. And to Jesus, His Father was everything. And my Father committed suicide. And the Father in heaven ever, never ever left Jesus, but because of who he, because he became as us, because of who we were. He was separated for a moment from God. And God's own heart broke that He even had to separate Himself from the Son for us so that we could never again say that we have to be separate. In all forms became as us, in all points became weak, tempted, but never sin. So He was a perfect lamb, ready to be slain. God was rich in mercy and He bankrupted the whole vault and put it in a man called Jesus. And He said, I'll place that man in the earth just to be as you, to walk as you, to understand you, to fellowship with your sufferings, to walk through the left side of your drug dealer's house and tell you that I love you and I can change you. That's our Jesus. He's not a dead religion. He's not an impressive three-point sermon. He could care less about that. What kind of award will you get when you get to heaven? The best sermon award? The best Instagram award? The Lord is love. He is life. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. The Lord Himself is life. And I met life that morning. I didn't meet religion. I met the person my mother would tell me about. I met the person my father used to seek that I'd watch him adore. I met that Jesus. I met forgiveness. I met freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. No longer are you a slave. We sing it every week. I'm no longer a slave to fear. It's the absolute truth. You are a child of God. And God wants to give you freedom. And so the Lord, (laughs) so I started to, I just lost it. And as the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, I said, God, I, I, I want to give you my life. I, I mean, the house smelled like disgusting and cigarettes everywhere. And, and I, I was sitting, I'll be even more vulnerable. I wasn't even clothed. I was sitting in boxer shorts alone. I wasn't even clothed. I wasn't clothed or in my right mind like some other man in a Gadarenes area. I was not in my right mind or clothed. 
and it it stank, but Jesus didn't judge me. Did he convict me? Oh, yeah. Did he, was his holiness eminent? Oh, yes. Did I still want to go and just smoke more? No. I wanted him because I tasted of John 10.10. I came to bring life and life in abundance, abundantly. My girlfriend came home at just after five. She heard two words come out of my mouth she'd never heard before. I said, Alina, I said, I'm sorry. She never heard me say that. I used to blame her for everything. It was all her fault. Some of you husbands, you older men, you, you love God, you blame your wife for everything. The Lord doesn't hear your prayers. You've been, you've had the bucket loads of mercy poured over your soul and you hold your wife to account for the smallest things. The Lord doesn't hear your prayer. You need to get your heart back with the Lord and be fresh in the spirit of the Lord and just in, in the joy of His beauty and forgiveness. <laughs> and so uh, Alina was like, what's happened to you? And I said, I saw Jesus. I, Jesus, I, He spoke to me and I didn't see Him physically, but He came in the room and I said, Jesus, He changed my heart. And I said, and she's like, are you okay? Maybe we need to go to sleep. I said, no, 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 Alina. I said, really? And she knew. Two or three days later, sleeping next to her still, I didn't really know how to become you know, I had some things to still work out in the first times of God, but God's so merciful. I'm sleeping next to her. All of a sudden she'd wake up screaming and she'd say, I was being chased by a lion in my sleep. She's not a Christian, has no background as a Christian. I'm being chased by a lion, but the lion had no teeth and, and it got to me. But these 144,000 people who had white robes, they were safe from the lion. She's never read the Bible. She's never read Revelation. And I didn't even know where that was, but I said, I think the, that 144,000 things in the Bible and she became a Christian too. She got radically born again. She got set free, delivered, all that stuff. And then I began to go on this track and this course of actually walking with the Lord. There was no YouTube. So I read my Bible four to five hours a day and I just sat in front of the Word. I buried my life between the covers of this book and I found out that everybody talked about Jesus. Why wouldn't you talk about Jesus? Oh, Ben, you're more bold, you're passionate. No, I'm a 70% introvert. I love being alone. Oh, you're this, Ben, you're that. Everybody can categorize everybody. And as long as you can get out of you actually following God, like, come on, we have to be bigger than this. So I began to preach the gospel. I was nervous. I was claustrophobic. I was afraid of planes. I never darkened the hall of a plane until I was around 20. And the first, oh, 16, sorry, was the first flight ever. And the next one was 27. I would gladly drive 20 hours rather than fly. Now I fly 200 days a year. All this fear, all this manipulation, all this control, all that was in me was actually defying me living until I met King Jesus. So I preached every day. I go to the street talk to people about Jesus, pray for the sick, cast out demons on the street. I remember my first time that I really had a word of knowledge. A woman, I was at a hot dog stand and I got the hot dog. And as I'm eating the hot dog, all of a sudden I looked at her and I knew that she was raped. I don't know how I knew. I just knew. And I went back to the hot dog thing and I said, excuse me. I said, my name's Ben. I, I believe in God. I said, I believe I heard something from God for you. And I didn't know how all that worked. And she goes, excuse me? I said, I believe I heard something from God about your life. She goes, I don't believe in God. She goes, I'm working. Thank you, but please, can you go away? And I was like, and I was really angry. And this guy started laughing at me. And I walked away and the Holy Spirit said, go back. And he said, she was raped when she was 14. The only reason she didn't want to hear what you said then is because she's angry. She thinks it was me who let it happen. And I went over to her and I said, excuse me. And the man's still standing. He's like, who is this idiot? And I, I looked at her and I said, I know that you said, go away. I'm sorry. I said, but Jesus told me you were raped when you were 14 and you blame God because he didn't save you from being raped. But it wasn't God. God hated what he saw and God was weeping as you were raped. And this woman, I mean, lost it. You know, she goes, can you please wait till the end of my shift? I led her to the Lord about five minutes after she finished work. And I begin to do that every day. And there was, no, there was no Instagram, there was no Twitter. I had this thing called wanting to please God. I had this amazing, profound thing that some Christians have called actually wanting to please the audience of one. Some Christians have it. Others are just trying to be pleased and, and fill their soul and flood their life with some kind of thing that <laughs> this temporary, this guy likes me, pastor hugged me today, I must be okay. Pastor won't be there on the day of judgment. Pastor doesn't give that oil of love to Jesus. He does that for himself. He can't do it for you. What about you and Jesus? I was just preaching because I love God and I tasted 
and seen and that the Lord is good and I had to tell other people God's good. And so I did. And then I began to seek the Lord and fast. And the craziest thing happened right after I was like six or seven months after I was saved, I got on a train in Melbourne, Australia, where I'm from, to Geelong, 50 minutes train ride. And I got on the train and it was pretty empty. And I had my Bible. I used to have a little Gideon's Bible. You know those little tiny ones? It has Psalms and Proverbs as well. Four hours and just like devouring this thing. And just love God. No one knows who I am. No one. I didn't care about that. I didn't care about being known. I cared about pleasing Him. I cared about truly knowing that when I'd read the Scriptures, I would, I'd be enlightened by the person of the Lord. I was really fascinated with Jesus because I'd just been saved out of such trash, you know. And all my friends started getting saved because they knew I was a different person. And I would trick them. You know, I'd invite them to church as a trick, you know. I came to your basketball thing, come to my church. I was very manipulative in a good way, you know. So come to my thing, you know. And uh, I'd say, this guy's sharing. He used to be in the mafia. This guy called Tom Papania, Papania or something. He came to Australia once. And I said, this guy used to be in the mafia, Matt. I said, come, bro. This guy was a, like a gangster. He goes, you serious? I said, yeah, come. And he sat there. And, and the, the evangelist, Tom Papania, who was once in the mafia, he was very good. He said, everybody stand to your feet. And he goes, now sit down if you're a Christian. And only the non-Christians were standing. And he was looking right at them. And he said, you must be saved. You know, crazy stuff. My friend got born again. But listen, all my friends, they all begin to, to drop into the love of Jesus. But something very strange happened to me. And this shows the sovereignty of God. And God is sovereign that you're watching. God is sovereign that you're sitting here. You're on God's calendar today. It's no mistake you're here. You think, no, no, I went to this church a month ago. And it is no mistake. Make no mistake. You can have an ordinary service. Oh, okay, that was a precious testimony. Or you can allow the life-changing, life-forming God of mercy to come over your life, to come over the swell of your porn addiction, to come over the swell of your anger toward blaming everybody else. You need to treat me this way and treat me that way. And Come on, man, look at the holes again. Look at the holes again and go, oh, if he stood here, the Lamb of God, the Emperor of the universe, if he stood here and held out his hands and showed you his holes, his blood dripping from them, you wouldn't have any excuse. You wouldn't, you'd let go of those little rights like that that all fall in his presence all the sickness in your body, you'd have faith for the healing power of God. The fire of the Holy Spirit would come on you. You wouldn't make excuses. The emperor with holes in his hands, it would be enough for you to say, here's my heart. Take the hole in my heart through those holes in your feet. Take the hole in my heart. Take the fake mask, the falsehood. So on this train, this is what happened. I fell asleep reading my Bible came to a stop and all of a sudden a man taps me on the shoulder and I wake up shocked and he handed to me a hand fishing reel hand one just like the one my father gave me over 10 years ago and I looked at it and he goes you dropped this he he was a tall guy big white beard and white long hair and he was about 70 I'd say and I go, no, 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 this isn't mine. I looked up, he was gone. And I was like, and the first thing I did was I tried to find him because I was like, I go, what the heck? I said, this isn't mine. I go, this isn't mine. I started to look and I couldn't find the guy. Now, I don't know whether he was a man or an angel. I don't know. I don't understand that part. I know it wasn't God because I didn't feel that eminence from him. But I did feel it was so strange. But he disappeared. Maybe he got off and walked left and I couldn't see him at the station we were at. I don't know. So I don't proclaim to know. But what I know is this. I know it happened after I was like, who the heck is that guy? No one else on the train in the, in the whole carriage, just me. And I sat back down and I'm holding this fishing rod. And the Lord said, now you catch me a fish. He said the same thing to me as a father. He said, you catch me a fish. And so I began to preach the gospel. And that's all I've done since. And I'm not shutting up anytime soon. <laughs> and, uh, and now we have a ministry called Awakening in Europe. I think um, Pastor Vlad wanted me to put one of the pictures up. I went into this little stadium. I think it might be up there somewhere. And I went in there by myself a few years ago and into Europe. And oh, no, not that one. That's, that's what happened after I went in there. Pastor Vlad wanted me to put the one of me standing there for some reason. No, not that either. These are all fantastic. And they're all actually what happened. There I am. I stood in that thing by myself. But the same voice... The same voice, I love you, Ben, follow me. The same voice, he said that thousands will turn to me. And I'm like, that's like my mom said. 
And so the, the end result was that we begin to preach the gospel all over Europe and we're still doing it today. And actually the, after that, that was a fun time walking in there and seeing nothing, having no favor in the German church, having no influence at all. Trust me, at all, like had nothing, no money, nothing. And, uh, and then the real picture of what happened was 27,000 people filled that stadium. That's an altar call. Two and a half thousand people answered the altar call on the very ground where Hitler used to preach and commission his army. And Jesus is commissioning an army of Jesus people all over Europe. It's awesome, man. It's so crazy. So, so now I'm trying to catch fish. And today I'd like a fish, but I just catch them. I catch and give. The Lord is the one after you. He's the Lord of the harvest. It doesn't matter if you're in this room and you've been a Christian 45 years. If you've lost that innocence and flame, if your respectability has become your God. Oh, I stand there and worship and I just quietly say, love you, God. You've lost that zeal. You've lost that, what the Bible calls first love fire, return to your first love. Jesus said, I don't wanna take your lampstand away. Jesus is not trying to take us away. But when He spoke to the church of Ephesians in Ephesians chapter, Revelation 2, when He said to that church, He said, please, He said, return to your first love. You know what He said? And by the way, you can't blame your leaders. This church was the best church in the world. You know who was the pastor of that church? At one time, it was Timothy. You know who else was in that church? Mary, the mother of Jesus herself was in that church. The revelator, John was in that church and Apollos. They had Apollos, John, Mary, and Timothy, all of them in that church, leading that church. They had apostolic, they had prophetic, they had glory, I'm sure. They're in the midst of a tumultuous uh, area and generation. They had miracles like crazy. They had the power of God. And Jesus even says that. He goes, you're known, people know you. You've got all this stuff. And He said, nevertheless, I have one thing against you. One thing only. When Jesus says He has anything against you, you quickly wanna make sure it's not against Him anymore. But He didn't say, I'm against you, like as in what a joke you are. Why would He tell you, hey, look, I've got something that really we need to talk about. I'm telling you this because I love you. He said, you've lost the zeal for me. You used to do this for me. You used to love me. You used to have a fishing reel in your hand thinking of heaven. You used to, you used to love this thing and just dive yourself and bury your life in the covers of the book here and, and be able to turn off your TV. Leonard Ravenhill said, how are we gonna destroy and pray? We destroy the strongholds of Satan if we cannot turn off the switch of the TV. We want revival, don't we? We want awakening, we want to fast, even fasting, it's amazing. And I fully feel the Spirit of the Lord on what they're doing and what you guys are doing, I feel it. But even fasting, you can pat yourself on the back and still be cold as ice in your heart and still mistreat your wife, still love your pornography more than Jesus, still be backslidden and go, I'm not coming to God. That's what I used to do to my mom, I'd threaten her. You know, one of my best friends now is my mother. You know what one of our favourite things to do together is? Is to tell people about Jesus together. You know what kind of a precious thing that is? Memories you can never ever get any other way except through the Spirit to, in each other. Living in the Spirit. Don't you want joy back? Jesus said, I warn you. He said, return to your first love. And He said, lest your lamp go out, lest I take it from you. He said that at around 40 AD in the church of Ephesus was dead completely shut down and closed by 50 AD. They had a 10 year window and they didn't follow. He wasn't rebuking Timothy. Jesus wasn't rebuking. We know John the Revelator, he was full on or Mary, the mother of Jesus. But the church, they were coasting, they were cruising and they need that mercy again. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. He so loved the world that He loves you enough to give you His whole life. Every hole, every scar, they tore ribbons off him and thought of you while they did it. <laughs> Would you give your heart to him today? Would you give your life to him today? You watching at home, would you be real with God? Would you take like I had the mask off and just say, Jesus, I'll be real with you? For God is rich in mercy and because of his great love with which he loves you. Even while you were dead, he made you alive together in Christ.